the constitutional right of protection of a right of freedom of expression ultimately supports democracy. This is the argument by Professor Adrian Stone, who teaches at the University of Melbourne in Australia. She's one of the world's experts on different approaches to free speech as a social good and as a cornerstone of democracies. She's also the author, forthcoming, of the Oxford Handbook on the Australian Constitution and with Fred Schauer, who has been a guest on this podcast, Think About It, the editor of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook on Freedom of Speech. How can different democracies define this right differently? In many democracies, the lines around speech are drawn differently. In the U.S., they are drawn to protect hate speech, but not child pornography, political speech, but not defamation in most cases. In other democracies, denial of the Holocaust or incitement of racial hatred is not protected by the state. How do we make sense of these differences? And is it really true that one way is the best way to assure that everyone can speak freely in a democratic society? Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. I'm really excited. I am speaking today with Professor Adrian Stone in Melbourne, Australia. So first of all, Adrian, welcome, and thank you for joining me on Think About It today. Oh, such a pleasure. So, so Adrian... You are the Raymond Berry Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Melbourne. You're also Kathleen Fitzpatrick Australian Laureate Fellow. And you direct, um, as I understand, the Center for Comparative Constitutional Studies. So not only are you an expert in Australian constitutional law, you've published a huge amount of legal articles and books, but also this comparative constitutional aspect that you are familiar with um, constitutional issues in several countries. You studied at Columbia University, taught at the Sorbonne, I believe. So you have an overview of these issues that are very, very different in different countries. Yes. So I would regard myself as studying freedom of expression really in, a, in as global a context as I can. Um, now, of course, nobody can be truly global and um, there are parts of the world which I know much better than I know other parts of the world. But I think it's a fascinating question to think about freedom of expression globally because it's actually a very high level of agreement um, amongst democracies that freedom of expression is a core value, but actually quite a lot of difference among them in the way they actually implement it. So you can see quite a fascinating illustration of how we can agree and disagree about rights at the same time when you engage in this comparative study. If if you start, did, I know you're you're in the process of editing a book, uh, an Oxford handbook on freedom of speech with um, Fred Schauer, who's been on the show. Um, so one of yeah. the major American experts on freedom of expression. He was the First Amendment lawyer at Harvard for a long time. Now he's at the University of Virginia. When you just said that in most co current contemporary democracies, there's there's agreement that freedom of expression is a fundamentally important thing. Right, it's it's critically yeah. important for us. When you, if you start right there, what is what what do people think is so important about it to start out as a basic? And I don't even want to say is it a right, is it a norm, is it a? Well, actually, I think I mean so just to be a little bit legal for a moment. It, what's really interesting to me is that actually all democratic constitutions contain a principle of freedom of expression, um, as some non-democratic constitutions. But I, I tend to not regard them as really um, something that we need. We have to look at with a totally different lens. But all democratic constitutions do and, and those the only two that don't have a kind of express principle are in Australia and Israel and in both of those circumstances uh, the courts have actually over time developed a principle so I think that really illustrates its centrality um, to uh, the liberal constitutional tradition that where it's not actually in the text courts disregard it as so obviously and implicitly part of the constitutional structure that they'll develop it now, what that actually means uh, is, uh, I'm sure many of the speakers on your program, guests on your program will have talked about the sort of multiple kind of reasons why we might value freedom of expression. And I think all of them, all of the classic um, 
justifications for freedom of expression reveal themselves in constitutional traditions of the world. But I think more central than anything else is that there's an agreement that freedom of speech or expression has a close relationship with democratic government. I think that's the one that dominates. Right. So, And people tend to say it with democratic government in several ways, that it allows and empowers citizens to express themselves, this kind of idea of autonomy that you can participate, and it legitimates governments because citizens have a right to address the government without fear of reprisal, without that there's a legitimacy on the side of power and government and autonomy, citizenship, democratic self-governance on the side of the citizen. Exactly. And I would also really emphasize one thing that I think has been central to at least some traditions has been the idea of exposing government or exposing abuse of power and checking uh, abuse of power, which is consistent with what you said, but I think has been certainly at least over the latter half of the 20th century, was thought to be a really sort of core uh, rationale for freedom of expression. I actually think you added something. I said legitimacy, right? So the government can be sort of criticized or challenged, but you're saying it can also be held accountable and so that when there's a transgression on the side of the government, because, of course, the government has a huge monopoly on force, on using force, so the citizens can speak up and criticize that. That's right, and they have a huge monopoly on information about their own, um, about its own operation. And so a principle of freedom of expression is one of the mechanisms which you bring some form of transparency into government. And that can be a really important basis for exercising all the other rights that, that you've talked about, that right to criticise and participate and um, the preconditions for really understanding that our government is legitimate. And as a comparative constitutional scholar, actually, I have to confess, you're not the first comparative constitutional scholar, but you are really the first one to really address it from a non-American perspective. I've had a lot of, right. <laughs> part, partly because the podcast has grown from its original interest in freedom of expression, especially on campus, to journalism. and But I've always thought of universities as these kind of test cases or symbolic sites mm. where things are negotiated that uh, have great relevance for the public in general. So if I could just have you start maybe as an Australian. So you said Israel and Australia don't have it written in the, in the Constitution. Mm. Is that different? That's for Americans pretty much, I'll just exaggerate a bit, inconceivable. <laughs> it isn't the first uh, fundamental. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I think that's right. So let me just say something. One of the things, one of the reasons I really like to do this comparative work in freedom of expression that I think it's important is that um, there's an enormous body of thought, literature, and this incredible body of case law that springs from the First Amendment. There's, there's nothing like it anywhere else in the world, and I really admire it. But it does tend to dominate, uh, certainly legal discussion, but also to some extent, I think many scholars of the First Amendment also dominate our theoretical or philosophical understanding of freedom of expression. I think it's actually important to pull the two apart because, you know, regardless of what you think of it, the First Amendment actually is kind of highly specific um, and quite unusual in world terms. So um, let me just talk about Australia for a minute. Um, Australia is um, actually an old constitution in world terms, more than 100 years old. Um, but it was formed in quite a different way to the US Constitution. It was really a coming together of colonies for the purposes of external defence and internal free trade. And it wasn't really meant, unlike the US Constitution, to mark a sharp break with the pre-existing legal order. It was a break of a kind, but not a really sharp break. And um, at that time, the Australian colonies really, and the colonists, um, adhered to the you know, the British understanding of rights being protected through the common law and through your part in a democratic process. So the Australian Constitution has this, this strange status. So on one hand, it's very influenced by the US Constitution and the way it put together its federal structure, but very influenced by the Westminster British tradition in the way in which it implemented parliamentary government and in its lack of consideration of rights. Um, as constitutional elements. So it's sometimes called a Washminster constitution, right? So it's <laughs> half Washington, half Westminster. Um, it also has some actually uh, important parts, and particularly the amendment process, which is very influenced by Switzerland. Um, but, so you have this old constitution, and then it's this unusual constitution that it was very hard to amend, and so it's not received a major revision during the 20th century. It didn't, um, and that's partly because of the 
sort of tranquility of Australia's geo lucky geo political position. So we've not had a sort of exogenous threat or shock like war in a serious way, or we've not, unlike Canada, had a threat of secession or something that made us sort of reconsider the whole project. Right. So there's no it's difficult to do and there's been no really big moment to make us do that. So we've got this actually old constitution. So the courts have to some extent stepped in and developed doctrines that reflect what is, I think, the post-World War II consensus about constitutional rights and have said, in effect, that the Australian constitution, although it doesn't include a constitutional right of freedom of expression, what it does do is it implements a democracy. It implements, it requires very specifically that the Houses of Parliament be directly chosen by the people, and then the Australian courts have said, well, we need, we need to make sure that the conditions for that choice to be a true choice are in place. And those include a freedom of expression that's relevant to you as a voter. And so that move, which wasn't made until 1992, um, but that was made in a very exciting time when it did that. Um, and I guess we now have 20, more than 25 years of um, a distinctly Australian jurisprudence of freedom of expression that's come out of that. Um, it's been somewhat influenced by the Constitution in our, about by the First Amendment, but it's also taken its own path, um, a path which brings it closer but not exactly in line with countries like Canada, for example. It's quite interesting, if I understand you correctly, that if freedom of expression is one of the important um, requirements for the democratic process of elections, whereas in this country sometimes it's seen that freedom of speech is really prior to just about everything. And I've had a lot of your colleagues on the show, and I've asked them quite seriously, is the First Amendment more important than the other ones because it is number one? And they said, no, 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 not at all. The 14th revises everything, and therefore everything has to be seen in its light. But people tend to think freedom of speech precedes all the things you would have just described as democratic process, election, all of that. And if I understand you correctly, you said the courts in Australia said, we got to make sure the political process works. And freedom of speech is one requirement, a necessary requirement of that process. That's right. So you don't need to mention it specifically, but it's derived from the process. And so um, and the, the Australian courts really emphasise that when they decide free speech cases, that what they are really deciding is not what they call a freestanding principle of freedom of expression, but one that is there to make sure this particular structure works. So we think of it as a structural principle. Can I say, though, that... Um, you know, as is the way there's, there's American scholarship that's relevant to it. There's this wonderful little book written in 1969 by the American scholar Charles Black, where he makes exactly this argument, um, although the Australian courts, to my knowledge, never understood or referred to it. And he, he says in that little book, it's called Structure and Relationship and Constitutional Law, that if there was no First Amendment, the courts would just develop one because you couldn't possibly conceive of the form of American government without an equivalent of the First Amendment. So fascinatingly, there are you know, really important American constitutional thinkers who think that exactly this form of argument would be required. But so, so what you're saying, this, um, what you call this structural requirement of freedom of expression, freedom of speech mm -hmm. as a structural requirement, I think a lot of the conversations in the United States are really... This is a personal liberty that must be defended. And yeah. it's not thought yeah. of as I have my right to say whatever I want to you and I should have this right protected, especially from the government interference, not because I help the democratic process, but otherwise I'm somehow impeded in my, let's call it autonomy or whatever other category it is. So uh, uh. if you could, could you unpack a little bit the structural understanding yeah. versus this other one, and I don't know how to really phrase it. Yeah. So I guess um, if you think about what are often sort of the big, the big sort of strands of thought that that um, that justify freedom of expression. Uh, on the one hand, it's part of an autonomous and dignified life, and a part of kind of realizing your personality, or it's part of the search for truth, or it's part of democracy. So what happens? One question we often ask ourselves in Australia: What's the difference between having this derived structural principle that opposed to having a straight out? provision that says there shall be freedom of expression. Well, one thing it does is it tells you straight up that the justification for freedom of expression in the Australian context is that third one. It is yeah. um, a democratic principle. And so sometimes it's thought, it's, it's a funny thing, we're very attached to the idea of text and sometimes it thinks 
you think, well, how, if this is a non-textual derived principle, it must be very vague and uncertain. But actually, I think it has a lot more content than just bare text because precisely because it is derived from this structure, we know, therefore, that's what it is to support. It, it's there to support. So the conversation we then have in Australia is not how can I best become the fullest version of myself um, and how does freedom of expression contribute to that, but how, what kind of a democratic quality do we want? That's what discussion, at least, I think we should be having, of course. <laughs> courts never quite do exactly what scholars clearly tell them to do, so it doesn't always come out like that. But that, that's what I think the discussion ought to be about it and basically is. Now, um, does that make a big, a, a really big difference? Well, there's a central set of cases that you would see in Australia that are just exactly, would present themselves just exactly and in familiar terms to other systems. So the Australian High Court just last week brought down an important set of decisions on a set of facts intimately familiar to scholars of freedom of expression elsewhere, which was whether safe access zones outside abortion clinics you know, buffer zones in which which protesting is not permitted, where they whether they are justifiable under um, under the what we call the freedom of political communication required by the Australian Constitution. Other cases have concerned things like protesting on street corners, um, uh, very familiar sets of facts of defamation of public officials. Um, so all of those things which are kind of central parts of, say, First Amendment law have also come up, although often being decided differently in Australian law. What I think does come outside of it, are, uh, there are a couple of sets of cases I would say arise under the First Amendment which um, are not so easy to see how they would arise under the Australian Constitution. So something like whether or not nude dancing famously is a form of constitutionally protected expression. <laughs> um, I, I suppose you could make a very attenuated argument uh, that somehow it develops your capacity as a person and that makes you a good citizen and that means you can vote. But it's a fairly attenuated form of argument and I think the Australian courts would, would not accept it. Um, so that kind of thing. And also I think a lot of more recent cases which tend to accept to give a lot of weight to expression that occurs within the course of ordinary commercial activity, that kind of expression, I think it's much easier to find a justification for regulating it in Australia because it's not really seen to be central to um, to the democratic process. If I stay with your first set of examples, kind of... Um protests yeah. outside of a health clinic or an abortion mm -hmm. clinic. We have cases in this country where people protest at the funerals of soldiers. Um, there's yeah. this, is there kind of a buffer zone or can they just be in your face right there? Or is it? A... Yeah. So that seems to me, I understand why they would think that's political speech in a way. It's an expression about a sort of a really important issue in the culture. And therefore, you should have as much space to express that. And you're mm -hmm. saying in Australia that would be decided from this perspective of this structuralist perspective of saying this is an important dimension of democratic life, not of your personal development, but of this, how you are part mm -hmm. of the polity. Well, it's actually interesting. So the Australian court actually just had to grapple with that question is, is discussion about abortion always political? It, and, and it really said, well, not always. You know, the discussion that a woman might have with her doctor about whether or not she ought to proceed to have a termination, we would not regard that as political within the context of the Australian Constitution. So that's actually a more difficult proposition to justify than it looks like, because if the question is, is the information that you get in that conversation relevant to you as a voter, I could imagine it might well be. But the Australian court, without really providing an adequate justification, I think, has responded to what is a very strong common sense feeling that no, that actually is just a communication of a different matter, nature. It's, and, and I think it's going eventually to turn out something like it's not proceeding upon our roles as citizens, that we have some roles in our lives that where we're not acting as citizens, but we're acting as in, in a personal capacity in those circumstances. Our, our communication should be understood differently. Okay, so the court said, no, there is that category of communication we would not regard as political. Um, and, and they say quite nicely something like this, that the decision of whether or not you personally should exercise a moral choice is not the same as political discussion about whether that moral choice should be allowed altogether. So they, they draw a distinction there. 
but then they say, well, protesting outside an abortion clinic is essentially really an argument to change the law. And if it's an argument to change the law, then it's something that is part of our political discussion and something that we need to inform ourselves about in order to be active citizens. So, um, But this, this is, to me, really interesting to think that the, so the justices think, does this speech um, participate in a constructive way, which could be very, very critical, but still constructively participate in how we live together as a democracy, how all people live together in this way? Whereas, whereas here there's a kind of tendency to look at speech as something rather isolated, rather individualistic, kind of atomistic. It's my speech, whatever mm -hmm. I say, it's whether it makes sense to you, whether it's totally critical of even us having a conversation, whether it makes even going so far as to criticize the entire setup that these judges even have any authority, etc. All of this is staked on the individual. And I think Americans very much attach a lot of symbolic and real significance to this because they believe this is the essence of what the courts are supposed to protect. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, so, so one way to think about freedom of speech on the kind of understanding that I'm ad advancing is that it is a sort of a communitarian goal because we can't have democracies except in communities. Uh, democracies arise out of communities and they serve communities. Um, and of course, you know, one aspect of that community might be, you know, protection of, of the right of individuals to flourish in their, their own ways. But that, that democratic part is essentially a collective goal. Um, and I think there is some of that uh, reason. Certainly, I would advance that understanding. And I think that it's at least consistent with, although not expressly articulated by the Australian court. But I will say this, Australian courts are very... Uh, in certain contexts, very, very keen to make it clear that um, political discussion in Australia can be um, very robust. Um, and, and there's this expression which they use sometimes, that it involves insult, calumny, evective and emotion, that, that yes. you, can, you, know, you can be very corpy. And, and I actually really think there's something quite distinctly Australian in this. So, so I will say that I think the court has been relatively hostile to civility norms um, in discussion. Um, and I think it's partly out of a sense, a very deeply Australian sense that um, civility is kind of an old world monarchical value and not really appropriate for an egalitarian society of the new world. Um, uh, and, and that that partly explains why I think uh, anti-civility, that you know, the civility is a norm that the court is very reluctant to recognise is a legitimate goal. Civility without something more, without some right. other right. You know, goal attached to it. Um, so that, and that's my sense um, that, that that's what it comes to is a sort of um, sense that one of the ways in which we are an equal society is that we don't tend to require these kinds of civility norms. It's, I actually really like this. I think it really resonates for people. And America has a very ambivalent relation with this idea of civility. It gets invoked quite a lot in speech discussions, but as a shared norm, without really anybody knowing who's going to set the terms for civility. And I think I've spent a lot of time in Australia. I was very fortunate. And you're right. People, <laughs> yes, I, I, I was very lucky. And actually, people people are, don't put a lot of stock on being civil because it's a little bit um, artificial. It's not genuine. It's not really who you are. Actually, there's an authenticity against it. It's sort of you're Australian, you speak your mind, and you can take it. And That's right. it's sort of this is actually kind of a rough and tumble and everything else is a bit stuck up and it involves power yes, and hierarchies, right. which are not really what Australia is all about. Right. So that's actually quite interesting. Which, if I can go to this, this understanding and this, this approach to speech that you are advancing, um, sort of extrapolating from the Australian model, this would be a useful way of thinking about it. You would think around the world. So, um, this is so. Can you sort of say how this plays out? Not in every single constitution that you're studying, but sort of sure. this is a different way of framing that question, right? It, it is, and and so, and I think it pops up in different ways. And I think the Australian one. I'm glad we went into it some depth, but you know, you could go into any other system in just as much and more depth and, and get a distinct position. But I think that this sense that a constitutional right of freedom of expression frames or provides a mechanism to encourage a form of political discussion 
a form of public discourse that actually supports democratic government is something that you can see uh, more generally. So another country that I've enjoyed studying, for example, in Canada, um, it reasons it in quite a different way. Um, the Canadian courts have um, made much of the notion of the relationship between equality and uh, freedom of, of expression. And in fact, in doing so, uh, they've drawn upon the very important work of the First, First Amendment work of Catherine McKinnon. So I want to acknowledge that. But you know, one thing that is pervasive through the Canadian law of freedom of expression is a view that Canada is a society committed to freedom of expression. It is also a society committed to equality and to preserving a sort of form of multicultural diversity. And that that affects Canadian free speech law in very interesting ways. So that limitations on expression, such as certain kinds of hate speech laws uh, or regulations, say, of pornography, which would just be uncontroversially, uncomplicatedly, definitely under constitutional under the First Amendment, are justified in Canada on the basis that they, that they serve another constitutional value in the form of equality um, or multicultural diversity. Can, can, and the courts will say... Can we yep. stay for this for one minute? So this um, concept, as you said, where they're drawing partly on Catherine McKinnon's important work, can you, can you define yep. or unpack uh, what is meant by equality there? So it's not everybody is the same, but so what what is this constitutional value, which of course in the U.S. Constitution and most democratic constitutions is probably also a value. So what what emphasis or do they place on equality? Well, so at least in the Canadian position, what I would want to say is distinctive about the um, way in which the courts recognize it is actually not so much. There is something distinctive about the concept of quality. I know that the Canadian courts will always say that they're really interested in substantive quality over formal equality. So they'll ask the question, you know, how is it that we ensure that the laws operate in a way that people are actually equal? I'm going to, um, I'm going to stop, you, you, stop you one second again. Yeah. Just to underline what you just said. So there's substantive equality over formal equality. So that's McKinnon has developed mm. this. Can you just give me two sentences on the difference between substantive equality, which Canadian law or the Constitution invokes, versus a formal equality? So formal equality would require that the law treats you the same. Okay, so there is this famous old Canadian case that predates their charter, which involved the denial of um, unemployment benefits to people who were pregnant. And um, the courts rather stupidly right. said, well, no, that's not a gender-based discrimination. It's a discrimination based on pregnancy, and it applies to pregnant people. <laughs> it actually does say something almost as ridiculous. As that. Now, the courts have, you know, well and truly come to their senses later on and said, well, you know what? There's actually a fairly close relationship between being <laughs> pregnant and having a particular gender, and so we now regard this as a gender-based discrimination. <laughs> now, in a very crude way, you can say that's the difference between formal and substantive okay. equality. Um, uh, although I wouldn't actually want to insult the U.S. court by thinking that that, that is a form of reason to which they're truly committed. So, so but I think this, this question is, you know, so this is the way the courts in Canada will, will look at a law. Let's imagine we have a law that impinges on freedom of expression, but, but, but it is understood and it is justified as pursuing equality in some sense. So a hate speech law directed at preventing um, uh, uh, um, uh, racial minorities to being subjected to, you know, really hateful, inciting uh, language. The courts have said, and here's, I guess, the reason goes something like this to be somewhat rough about it. We accept that the aim of this law is to pursue equality within Canadian society. And um, we will accept the Canadian Parliament's judgment that this law is necessary. Um, so they won't investigate themselves directly the empirical grounds for the decision. They will, um, they will accept a reasonable judgment by the Parliament based on some evidence. And then we will scrutinise fairly closely to make sure that the laws are not sort of disproportionate or over the top. We'll scrutinise the way the law pursues this end um, to ensure that, for example, there wasn't a way of achieving it that was less um, restrictive of freedom of expression, to make sure that it really is a law that is directed towards that end. Now, I think that that's really interesting. Um, and here's what I think is really different about it. Uh, I don't think it represents a truly different understanding of equality so much as I think 
probably plenty of people who adhere to really standard First Amendment conception would say, absolutely, I agree that equality is one important and two what needs to actually be real on the ground and not just formal. What is really interesting is that the way in which the Canadian court is prepared to accept that the parliament can act in a good faith and constructive way in its regulation of speech. So these laws like that have been upheld in Canada would be unconstitutional in the US because they're content-based laws. Um, it's just presumptively impermissible for uh, the state to regulate a message because of its content. Whereas the Canadian courts will say, no, actually, we, we don't think it's presumptively invalid. It could be invalid. It might not be, could be valid, could be invalid. Um, but we at least will be open to the idea that the state might act legitimately in this way. So that seems to me to really turn on not just the concept of quality, but something really deep in the political culture and tradition about the way that we understand the threats to free speech and the role the state plays. So that's why and, and you see a very similar form of reading in Australia. So I, I say that this is a kind of uh, form of free speech that I'm still looking for the best word to describe it, but in a sense it's permissive, right? It, it, it takes seriously the structure that we talked about at first. We want to achieve this structural, um, we want to, this structural goal, this form of discourse that allows us to have a democracy. And step two, we think sometimes we will permit the state, therefore, to intervene in relation to free speech regulation to create that community. So that's a very different, um, somewhat different understanding from what happens. So not just in the U.S. and I, I mean, there are many other democracies. So there's many other countries you've studied where that would probably be played out slightly differently. But I think this gives us a good handle of a different approach to think about speech differently and the role speech plays in a democratic process and where to put the emphasis, where to start with the starting point. When I heard you recently at Cardozo Law School, you were in a panel and um, I want to shift a little bit to say, is this an, is, there's a whole free speech debate it's all over the world right now. Is this the old problem with some new urgency? Is this, haven't we seen this before? Catherine McKinnon has been writing for some probably 30 years. She just came out with a book, Butterfly Politics, this last year, I think, or maybe this year. But you would think, I, I lived through these debates in college, and I'm 50-some yeah. years old, and there was the words about uh, pornography and obscenity and, race and, and, and hate speech and all this stuff. Or is there something that you think shifts when you're looking at this global um, playing field. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I think we're in a really new moment. Um, so, you know, one of the joys of being a free speech scholar, and I think you're interested in free speech, you'll experience it too, is it just keeps on giving. You know, it's, a, <laughs> it's an endlessly, well, you know, um, you, you an get, endlessly interesting. But you got to tell me why the joy in is. Sometimes you think you only see horrible cases and you're just an ex yes, ex I suppose so. <laughs> it's just endlessly interesting and always relevant. Um, and, and sometimes you see, you know, old, um, old disputes just being relitigated again in a way. And some of the what I told you about happening in the Australian courts is really familiar to what's happened in the US courts because, you know, we're, we're different societies, but the same things keep coming up. But I think everywhere in the world, we are in the last 10, 20 years, really looking at something new and different. And um, one of the reasons to really think hard about comparative constitutional law in this context is we might, we might want to think about whether we need really new solutions. Um, so this is this is what I think is new, and I, I'm not just not the first to notice this, and I'm drawing on the work of a lot of other people in saying this, but that one way to think about the modern form of public discourse is that it's actually a new free speech economy. And it's a new free speech economy in this sense, that um, we now have a vastly different set of actors. Communication has become much easier. All of us can be, participate in, well, most of us can participate in mass communication in a way we couldn't have dreamt of even half a generation ago. Information is no longer scarce. It's everywhere. We all carry in our pockets a device that gives us access to more information than you could possibly have imagined even 20 years ago. And that would have, you might have thought, and somebody, some people have thought originally, had a lot of democratic um, promise. But 
And as I'm sure anyone living in the United States is acutely aware, actually what it has given us is not a resolution to our old problems, but a set of new problems. So one way to think about it now is that the problem we have with freedom of speech is not information scarcity, but just information overload. The idea that now we're faced on a daily basis like a fire hose of information. So there's quantity. The second thing is we're being deprived of the institutions that used to help us sort out what we could trust and what we didn't trust. And the demise of the legacy media in particular, where we're losing our trusted sources of information. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to tell what we should trust and what we shouldn't. And a third dimension to this arises in the way that the great speech aggregators of the social media operate, so the fangs, the Facebook. Amazon, Google, and, and Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> Twitter. something like that, yes. But, yeah. or, Net, or Netflix or something. But anyway, they, these, these speech aggregators working together. But they create what have been called filter bubbles. So everyone knows the way in which, you know, if you click on one kind of article, you tend to get another kind of article that you're likely to click on, so right. it would be one that you agree with. And so we tend now to move within not conversations of people we disagree with, a common social conversation, but a highly divided uh, set of private conversations. Mm -hmm. So those three things operating together mean that we really need to start conceptualising the threats to our public discourse differently. The threat is not so much that we will have a government acting in a self-interested way of keeping information from us so that we should be wary of censorship. The threat is actually that private actors can manipulate us in a way that means we have access to information but no capacity really to evaluate it and to make decisions about it in our own interest. So that, I think, calls for a different kind of understanding of freedom of expression than the classical liberal understanding um, that the threat is the censorship um, right. that arises from government. If, I, if we can go through those three categories for a moment, so there's more quantity, there's much more speech, there are no more gatekeepers, no more nightly news, no more big news outlets that edit and filter all this. And then lastly, you said they are filter bubbles, so we hear what we already know we probably will most likely agree with. The first one on quantity, there used to be an understanding that more speech is better for democracy, because we need all these ideas out there, and the better, the more ideas. And now we have so many ideas, and we don't have enough smart people to read through it. Because, you know, so what's the, the quantity? Of course, you could also say, 30 years ago, there were so many law review articles, you couldn't read any, you could never read all of them on freedom of mm -hmm. speech. even. <laughs> so the quantity is linked also that all of us have access, which we thought was a democratization. And I think what's interesting about that, when I listen to these debates, there used to be a positive idea, everybody can now participate. And then there's a lot of anxiety that everybody can participate. Because it was, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of clear who... <laughs> Yes, exactly. Like, <laughs> and this is the problem. So we have to really now think about it. What is it that we're looking for? Mm -hmm. You know, are we looking? And, and, and to some extent, you know, the, uh, one of the most important. I'm sure you know American uh, theorists about freedom of speech. Alexander Mackeljohn said this wonderful thing. The important thing to him, yeah. this is his view, not the First Amendment view, is not that everything should be said, right? Not that everyone should have an opportunity to talk, but that everything that's worth being said is talked right. about. Uh, and I mean, and that's a that's a deeply non-libertarian conception on freedom of right. expression, and it requires us actually to have a goal in mind. Now, I've always been rather more attracted to that um, idea of freedom of expression, but my own view is that it is now becoming almost undeniable that the wisdom in that is almost undeniable. The classic sort of objection to it is that once you have this kind of curated public discussion, you're giving somebody the power to make those decisions. And that body, whether it's a court or a legislature, is likely to be incompetent or self-interested. Or will be judged to be wrong in history in 100 years from now. Yeah, even in good faith, they right. can just get it wrong. We only have choices between a public discussion which is dominated by private actors in which there is... The problems I've described of speech clutter, filter bubble, and the lack of, um, of, of institutions of trust. So that we've got that world, or we've got a world in which we allow somebody 
some political actor to have at least a role in determining the kinds of expression that deserve the most protection. Once you give this kind of value to speech, that it actually contributes to a democratic society, um, yeah. it doesn't immediately lead to uh, someone being able to say, this speech is good, helps us healthy, nutritious. This speech is bad, doesn't work for democracy. We got to limit it. Yes. And of, of course, also, there's a footnote that there's always been a recognition of low value speech or all sorts of speech that is regulated. So it's not that actually yeah, Michael John course. said anything goes yeah. in America, you can say anything you want, there are no consequences, there are lots of consequences. So I think that's also yeah, yeah. part of, I think I've spent 50 hours now trying to carefully make that point, the point that there's speech that the court, the court doesn't even look at it. They say there's low value, this is obscenity, this doesn't have a purpose, or this is some other commercial speech that can be regulated. So I, I absolutely, um, absolutely accept everything you've just said. And actually, one thing that I often find myself saying, like a broken record, is that, you know, nowhere in the world is freedom of speech absolute. And uh, there are certain classes of free speech libertarians in Australia that look with longing eyes to the United States. And I, I like to remind them, look, even in the United States, there are lines drawn in the and in important places, and so we, we're all in the business of drawing lines. It's just a question of where they are. Right. Um, and the second thing I want to say is, you know, one of the problems about being a comparativist um, is, at least in a conversation like this, you can't always do uh, justice to all the texture and depth in every uh, system. So, um, as you know, you and I met when I, I spoke at Cardozo, and after I, I spoke at Cardozo, one of my American friends said to me, look, that's all very well what you say, but we really don't want Steve Bannon deciding what our <laughs> speech rights are. <laughs> that's, fair, that's a fair enough point. But I think it's important to realise that once you kind of move away from the very strong classical liberal obsession with censorship as being the only free speech evil, that suddenly anything goes suddenly any form of government regulation. Now, so what you will see is if you look at places like Australia and Canada, and Germany is another, you know, very interesting example, is actually quite um, a complex system in which in different ways speech is regulated and the regulations are reviewed by courts and that there's you know, quite a complex division of labour between those institutions as to determining where the right limits lie. So... It isn't an all or nothing choice. We don't have to have a strongly libertarian concept of freedom of expression or nothing. There is a middle part. And the middle part, I wonder if we can go back to one thing you said much earlier. Um, oh. Is the role of parliament or the legislative there quite an important one? When you said the Canadian government actually gives it back and says, it's for you to decide whether this actually is harmful or not. So this this assessment, whether speech contributes to democracy is not for the courts then to look at every single thing, but say, this is actually not our business here. We uh, This should be in a different place. And a couple of people have been on the show who said the Americans have gravitated over the history of the last hundred years, really, to give the court more and more power to decide and less and less leave it in the in the, in Congress to decide what law statutes actually work. Right. Um, so I think that that absolutely is the way that most other systems of freedom of expression proceed, is that they allow majoritarian bodies a greater role, and not and nowhere an exclusive role, but a greater role in determining uh, how it is that we ought to understand freedom of speech. Now, I sometimes talk to American constitutionalists who just find it inconceivable that a legislature could take seriously a constitutional value like freedom of speech unless it was subject to uh, hard forms of judicial review. Now, I'm actually, this is one benefit of having spent, you know, my academic life in another system is that, you know, I have seen in many places exactly that can happen that where the constitution is a less complex, well, where the constitutional principle of freedom of expression is not understood to be the be-all and end-all of freedom of expression, then there can be, at least sometimes in some societies, under certain conditions, a good faith civil discussion about a value like freedom of expression that is undertaken by the polity itself and not by the courts. Now, I don't want to make too much of this. It requires a particular kind of political culture. 
but it's not impossible. I mean, most of our discussion in Australia, for example, about freedom of speech, which is very robust and very cantankerous, does not occur within the constitutional framework. It just occurs between political actors who say, uh, I have a commitment to free speech and it leads me to this. So now, I don't know how you get to there from where you are in the United States, but I think it's at least important to break open our concept about freedom of expression to say it might not be impossible that a legislature could act in a constructive way and that it's not impossible that a court can tell the difference between a good faith and constructive intervention and a bad faith, self-interested intervention. I, I think you're putting your finger on a really complicated historical moment. It's not a good, it makes metaphor, you, <laughs> but because where we are in the United States is that there's a, a reflexive um, response to say, this is going to go to the court, First Amendment, they'll decide. And then everybody thinks they know how they're going to decide. And then we've seen decisions that fly in the face of what liberals thought and fly in the face of what conservatives thought. So it's not even that consistent. But there's a sense in which now people are thinking, wait a minute, maybe rushing everything to a First Amendment decision is not the right approach. And it's because decisions don't seem to make sense to a lot of people. I think that's why we have this huge discussion in the in this country, in the United States right now, around these issues, ranging from athletes protesting at football games to abortion clinics, access to college campuses. That I think what you're saying is this would be a way to maybe think about this entire issue of free speech from this prescriptive approach to say it has a political function and the legislative has a role to play. And the courts yeah. could say, we trust that in good faith, you're trying to advance the interests of, of the democracy and not restrict it. In circumstances of the kind of high political polarization that exists in the United States now, I can understand why that particular argument might just fall flat with some people. All I would want to say is that um, a comparative study at least makes us aware of these possibilities and that it's worth considering, and this would be very much for Americans to consider, and I want to take off my normative hat when I speak about the First Amendment, that, you know, there are these problems, there are other places in the world that are also democracies that also have problems that deal with these in a different way and beginning to think a little bit about you know, the fact that other democracies manage to function, not perfectly, but nowhere's perfect, uh, with a different understanding of freedom of expression might call into question whether you need to really take upon all of the costs that the current Friend of the First Amendment approach requires America to do so. I mean, free speech is a hard value. It has costs. You're going to be committed to it. It has costs. But whether all of them that are currently imposed by the modern understanding of the First Amendment are necessary, you know, is at least worth reconsidering. In fact, that's sort of consistent with the value of free speech itself, right, is to, 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 to actually critically engage with the value and not just regard it as a sort of dogma that can't be questioned. Right. Right. It's interesting that you say it's a hard, it, it comes with costs, like all rights, they, it comes with costs. And yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that you get a lot. I'm sure that I get a lot also, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer by any means. And people say, I can't believe how people even live in those countries where you can't say what you really want to say. It's, <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine living in France or in Canada or in Australia where, and then the next one is usually a bit hyperbolic, where you could go to prison because you say X, Y, or Z. And then what becomes quite interesting, the X, Y, or Z is almost exclusively um, hate speech. It's rare. Yeah. It's rarely because I insulted a company or said, you know, this particular company produces a you know faulty product or something like that. It's almost always hinges on that. And and then, as you know, there's a lot of scholars, some of them have been on the show, who maintain that protecting hate speech is actually the greatest principled approach that America takes. That's the test case where America distinguishes itself, sets itself apart, and is superior to all other democracies. <laughs> so I'm paraphrasing. Yep. So, yep. so how do you respond yep. when people say, how do you even live in Australia, Edwin? You can't say anything you want. <laughs> 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 okay, a couple of responses. One is, 
can I say? Australia is quite a good comparator. But in fact, the limits on, that we have on free speech are on a, on a day-to-day, so it's a quotidian basis. I think that they are more about social taboos and norms than they actually are about laws. So most of us, we regulate our speech all the time because of what's socially acceptable. And my observation is, is that those informal social limits on what you can say are much stronger in the United States than they are in Australia. In fact, um, I'm constantly slightly amused and slightly worried uh, when I have uh, Americans come to Australia and they'll see some comedy show or an advertisement or something that seems to them, or they just listen to um, the way in which our politicians talk to each other. Yes. Uh, and they're just shocked at the level. I, I have to sort of apologise to my country for revealing this on an international broadcast, but, <laughs> but at the level of just coarse insult yes. and, um, um, you know, really quite extra, to Americanise extremely, extraordinary nature of public discussion yes. and I do know as an Australian dealing internationally I do have to kind of slightly moderate the way I talk internationally because we are a much franker and uh, more direct people than just about anyone in the world so that, I mean I think right. you need to actually think not just about legal suspicions but about taboo yeah. speech so I would say to your guests if you come to Australia in fact you may be pleasantly surprised now it is true that if you, without any good reason, decide to um, hurl racial abuse at a minority group in Australia and you do it in public and it's not part of an academic enterprise and it's not part of any artistic enterprise or there's no good reason for it, you might find yourself in a civil court and you might find yourself required to do something like apologise. Now, is that an infringement on your free speech? Yes, it absolutely is. And I think people just need to face very clearly it's not the whole of the story of free speech Mm -hmm. in any place. We have made that decision as a society, and it's very strongly supported. There was a move several times in the last five years by our current conservative government to amend that law, and it was roundly, roundly defeated in the court of public opinion, and they didn't proceed with it. If you speak to all of the ethnic and racial religious minorities in Australia, they are very, very attached to that provision, and most other Australians, you know, basically accept it. Uh, So, yeah, you couldn't hurl racial abuse, but you might find that you can have a very frank discussion Mm -hmm. about other things and maybe a frank discussion about some things that you couldn't talk about as easily in the US. It's it's really interesting in that I want to... Uh, take a, take us one step further when what you just said, um, because as yeah. you said earlier, when the quantity has changed, the gatekeepers are no longer there, and we live in these filter bubbles. Now, of course, it's not just you hurling some racial insult at a group in Melbourne in the street, but it's on the internet, and the entire world has it right away. Yeah. So yeah. this question came up in our Cardozo, and I'm going to talk to David Cole from the ACLU, who got that question also. What do you do about that? Because it doesn't even matter that in Australia you could have to apologize because you just posted on some some social media and then it it is everywhere. Yeah, so if there, I guess, is a strong argument against that kind of regulation, it not ari- it doesn't arise, at least in my view, for some from some moral concept of what freedom of expression is. It arises from some more practical consideration, which is actually you can't do it anyway. Um, so I guess you would say, so let me say two things. My view is that when you talk to Asian, Jewish, Islamic Australians, for instance, that they nonetheless think that it is very important to them that the law in Australia nonetheless recognises that those forms of expression are a harm to them. And so that there is a real expressive value in the law and that, um, and I should say Aboriginal Australians more than anyone else are the beneficiaries of this law. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a, a, a real sense in which that the presence of that law and its recent defence has made a strong cultural and political statement um, that is enormously valued by those communities. And that, that has a very important social role. So laws sometimes have value beyond its strict enforcement. That's really an important point, I think, and that the law has an important point and what politicians say, what our values are. So the free speech debate in America always goes like this, that we support the principle 
but it's an empty principle and we abhor the content. We are absolutely opposed. This, this in an unprecedented way, has fallen away with President Trump, who's the first president since Carter. So it's Carter, Reagan, George Bush the first, Clinton, George Bush the second, Obama, have all always condemned racial incitement and hate speech every single time. And so mm. the courts decide, we give them the freedom to talk, but we are completely against what they say. It's actually Carter said it's un-American. And so when that falls away, the symbolic force of the law becomes so important. Mm. But now the law in America is really looks to some people say it's just empty, but the people who have power mm. actually condone the message. So, mm. so it's tricky. So what you're saying mm. in Australia, that law actually says we have a value here. We have a value. And I think that's that. And, and so this is the, the and a completely other part of the law. It's not just how it's enforced, whether it's applied, but it's an expressive value and it has says something about who mm. we are as a country. And, you know, because I just, before I answer the other part of your question, I just want to say, you know, this just can be very significant. So the most controversial and recent case, uh, and, and most important recent case under this law, under the Australian Racial Discrimination Act, uh, the hate speech provision, concerned a controversial right-wing columnist of a flavour that would be very familiar to most people in most democracies around the world, who made some, I won't detail them, really rather sort of nasty statements about a series of prominent Aboriginal Australians. But what's really interesting to me was the way in which the remedies worked in this case. So what he was not required to pay any money damages, he was not required to apologise. He had to do two things. One was he couldn't republish those same statements. And the other one was insofar as those remained publicly available, so for instance, they're still available on the internet, they had to be accompanied by a statement that said these have been found to offend against the Racial Discrimination Act. Now, one up argument that I make about that case is, isn't it interesting that the remedy was a speech remedy? Right. The remedy was not that he was, in a true sense, silent. He clearly wasn't, and I might add that this person has his own television show mm -hmm. still. He wasn't in a true sense silent. It's just that when, uh, in relation to those statements, the state insisted on being able to speak back. Mm -hmm. And... Speaking back on the, the state speaking back on behalf of the victims of hate speech seems to me a very speech friendly way mm -hmm. to respond to this. And I think there's um, a scholar named Catherine Gelber who works on this very this idea of speaking back very intensively. We've got to remember that you know regulation comes in all kinds of forms and remedies come in all kinds of forms. Give me the and give me the reference again for this scholar. Catherine Gilbert who's written about this. Catherine Gelber, Gelber. Uh, at the University. Yeah, a, a political scientist at the University of Queensland has written a great book called Speaking Back about this idea of empowering the victims of hate speech to speak back on their own behalf, that that's a role for the state. So we just, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's a great idea. It's really interesting. There's a, there's a, a philosopher, Corey Brett Schneider, who I've interviewed, who is a pretty much a yes. free speech absolutist. So he, uh, but he also yeah. said, and nonetheless, the state has to speak out. So he's he has a similar yeah. idea that the state, that's actually quite important what you're ending up with that the law mm. expresses something even when it doesn't punish this this talk show host or this public figure but that there's added speech that gives people then at least this idea that they can decide yeah. what's what does this do for for this community yeah now i don't think the australian law was actually designed with that in mind i just think the courts have been quite creative in the way that they've used it but i i, I wanted to say that i think that they're it is relevant to consider here that there are just different ways in which you, the state can respond. And the regulatory response, response of censorship followed by sort of punishment is not the only one. Um, and so if we take seriously the idea that hate speech harms, which I do, uh, then one very useful thing to do is to have a law that is expressive and effectively empowers the victims to really ask for a statement of contradiction from the state. And, you know, the old idea that the best remedy for evil counsel is good ones or that what we ought to do when we're the victim of this sort of thing is respond, of course, has never taken into account power imbalances. You know, if you're an Aboriginal student and you're um, criticised and your face is printed on, an, on the, in a, an Australian newspaper, your own speech is likely to be not very, very good response. But the state's speech 
it's a different matter. So that's really interesting that the state can correct this imbalance in power, that someone who has a huge reach mm -hmm. can insult somebody and you say, well, it's our obligation that a person who doesn't have this access also can be assured to have some access. That's quite, so that, that's right. that power, yeah. power goes back to what you said much earlier, that would be a way of a substantive equal access to power rather than a formal one. Well, you can all speak out. It's like, well, if you never get printed anywhere, no one listens to you. But if the state says this has to be attached to the statement, it lends its force to that person. Quite interesting. Yeah. And, and I think it also is fairer to the victims in this sense, that one of the, the difficult things about being a member of a vilified minority, especially for sometimes for the elites of those minorities, is that they're constantly being required to undertake this difficult and traumatic experience of just offending themselves in the media all the time. And um, uh, I think that having the state do it on their behalf is actually to alleviate the excessive cost of that kind of interaction. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I have, this is a uh, not a direct analogy at all, but I've had um, a number of students on this podcast, not to because I have any kind of real power, but I said, I want to hear from you what it feels like to be a minority student huh. at a leading institution and have a speech controversy. And they all said without exception in these really insightful, hour-long, deep, really difficult conversations because they were there's no clear answer. They said, the one thing that's very clear, Uli, it is not my job to explain to you what it means to be black in America. And they said, I respect your podcast and I like what you're doing, but it is exhausting. And the burden, mm. the burden should not be on me to understand this. Mm. And it interferes with my education, but I'll do it here for mm -hmm. one hour, but I shouldn't be required 12 times a day to explain and justify why I'm here. So I wanted to add that voice mm. for people to say, well, yeah, everybody's affected by speech. And then give people a chance to really respond from from where they are, um, in the same way. Mm. So, it's, as for me, so this, so Adrian, this is, um, I really like the way you ended. You said there are other ways of thinking about it. There's a prescriptive way. There's a way of thinking of speech as a value in democracy, and that this new economy of speech poses all sorts of new problems. But there are ways to be creative that may be necessary in this new, new world we're living in. Mm. Really interesting. And then I'm going to ask you lastly, uh, when are you, um, when do you think you'll be publishing this, um, the Oxford Handbook on Freedom of Speech with Fred Schauer? <laughs> I would hope later this year or early next year. So oh. we're certainly well into the task. Yeah, very well into the task. Um, it is a multi uh, author volume, and that's, that, that poses some um, challenges that I'm sure you'll be familiar with. Yes, absolutely. Um, but, it just, uh, but it's it's proving to be a fascinating enterprise, pulling together thirty free speech scholars from around the world on a a bunch of topics. Um, and and one of the sort of joys of academic life is to uh, engage in a project like that. Yeah, fantastic, absolutely. And I and, and I do want to stress. I like that you laid out that it is possible to live in Australia. You don't feel muzzled <laughs> and, and censored all day, <laughs> right? And there, and, no, yeah. And there may yeah, be something to learn. There may be quite a lot to learn, actually, from these <laughs> these other approaches. Well, that would only be fair because I, I do want to say this. I um, I studied First Amendment law twenty years ago at Columbia Law School with greats like Vince Blasey and Kent Greenwald, oh. and um, I. It was a thoroughly fascinating and life-changing education. I'm grateful for it. I'm a great admirer of the tradition, even though I think other places need to make their own way. Right, absolutely. I mean, I think this is it, to expand the conversation. And it's very much in the spirit of free speech, that actually one would have many different robust perspectives and debates on this. Right, right. right. All right. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, um, I'm going to go to bed pretty soon, and I hope you'll have a really wonderful day in Melbourne. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for staying up. Great to speak to you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.